So something that I, I mentioned before where uh, substitution models. Um, and so I was talking about these variants at a particular location. So you can see here that this has a different base to all of these, um, which is fine. And that's, that's the principle for looking at differences in order to make a tree. But actually, uh, phylogeneticists want to make it a little bit more complicated than that because it's not as simple as saying, well, that's substituted to that. So that base, that nucleotide, has changed to that nucleotide. Because actually, in the course of evolution, some nucleotides are more likely to change into other nucleotides than others. Does that make sense? So you know in DNA, you have your A's and your T's together, and you have your C's and your G's. So they're less likely, that's a transversion, they're less likely to change into each other. You're less likely to get a C changing into a G or an A changing into a T and vice versa. You're more likely to get an A changing into a C or a T changing into a D, a G, because they're the same type of nucleotide. They're purines and pyrimidines. So when you take that into account, there is a bias to do with mutation. So you you don't just get random mutations. There is a bias between what kind of nucleotide they can turn into. And so substitution models take this into account. Uh, but yeah, so basically substitution models take that into account and they also take into account that you could have a mutation where you change an A into a G, but because we're talking about maybe hundreds or thousands of years, a G could go back into an A as well. And that might be more likely. And so it takes that into account. And so this is for calculating the distances on the branches. So you get different models for this. Can I click through that? Yeah, so this is what I was saying. You, not all mutations are equal. So you get transversions which are the less likely ones to happen, which is like here, an A to a T, because they're the pairs. And you get, oh, uh, that should say transitions, which would be an A to a G or a T to a C. And so these are far more likely to happen than these ones. And when you take them to account, you get these different substitution models and there are loads of different substitution models and it's you have to basically when you I think Sam will talk about this a bit more but when you uh, try and make a tree or something like that you try different substitution models and you see which one explains your data best Sam will explain this in more detail but you all you need to know is that mutations happen at different rates and there's biases for certain mutations. And it depends on your, your data. It depends on the genomes that you're looking at. The biases change. And the other thing that you need to consider is uh, bootstrapping for phylogenetic trees. So we're going to have a go at making a tree in a minute. But when you make a phylogenetic tree, you want to see how confident you are that you have a particular branch. So say you've got a, a tree here how confident are you that this is the organization of a tree? Because you've made your, multi um, you've made your multiple alignment, you've made it into a tree, you get this tree, how confident are you that this is the case? So what you do is you repeat the tree, so you keep making a version of the tree, but what you do is, if this is your original sequence, so you've got 20 bases here for this original sequence, because this is an example. And these are your different uh, organisms that you're looking at. And this is the original tree that you made. You might find that maybe there's just only a couple of positions that dictate that this branch goes here rather than here. And so what you do is you say, OK, well, there's 20 bases, um, oh, 20 positions, but I'm going to randomly select columns so you randomly select from here, you make sure that there's 20, but in theory you could have all of them as column one, although that's unlikely because it's randomly selected. And then you make trees based on that. And the idea of that is that if there's just a couple of uh, bases that seem to influence it, by randomly selecting this and bootstrapping it, so repeating this 
I don't know, 100 times or 1,000 times, you should um, be able to see how many times the tree comes out the same way. And so once, you, once you've done these replications, so you've made this tree with different pieces of data, so randomly selected pieces of data, you should get a confidence. So it says if you do a bootstrap 100 times or 1,000 times, it gives you a percent. So 75% of the time, you get this branch. So you could say quite confidently that this is probably right. And that's quite important in phylogenetic trees because sometimes you'll make a tree and you see this branch and you think, oh, this is amazing. This is showing exactly what I want to show. This shows the source of an outbreak. And then you look at the bootstrap value and it's 10%. And that means that only 10% of the time when you randomly select these, ba this, these columns, that this is actually the, the organization you get. It means that actually you can't be that confident. OK, so we're on to the next practical. We're going to try and make a tree. We're going to decide if a dentist is guilty or not. So basically, in the 1990s, there was a case where a dentist uh, who was HIV positive was accused of transmitting HIV to his patients, which is it's pretty bad. And so they, um, they sequenced the uh, virus from the dentist and from all of the people that had contracted HIV um, that were his patients. And then they made this into a phylogenetic tree um, to see if he was actually guilty or not of transmitting HIV to his patients. So we're going to see if you can figure out if he's guilty or not. <laughs> 